Professor Gwythian Prinz is with us this morning, an emeritus research professor at the London School of Economics and a former advisor to the MOD, to NATO and the UN. Thank you very much for being with us, Professor. Um, Good morning, Sarah. What's your assessment this morning of what has happened in Ukraine over the weekend before we talk about the G7, these attacks on civilian targets on cities like Kiev? Well, the two things are obviously linked. And uh, this is yet another, uh, as Downing Street correctly described it, stupid action by Mr. Putin, uh, completely counterproductive. Uh, the problem at the G7, as I'm sure was obvious to everyone, is that, uh, as in the EU, uh, the French and, to a certain extent, the Germans are out on a limb. Uh, they want to engage in some sort of uh, negotiation of appeasement with Mr. Putin. The rest of them didn't. Mr. Putin has now, by these bombardments of Kiev, successfully uh, managed to uh, marginalise Mr. Macron so that the G7 became united, and we therefore got uh, a resolve to surge the supply of heavy weapons after this meeting. So exactly the opposite of what presumably he intended. So when we say to increase the surge of heavy, heavy weapons, are we talking mostly about missiles? Are we talking about the range of those missiles and, and who well, will be providing them? Well, I, I think it's whatever it is that's required to do the job. Mm -hmm. um, it's pointless to speculate about the particular types. Mm -hmm. uh, I must say, if you'd said to me six months ago that the British would be supplying uh, a system called MAMBA, uh, with 50, uh, with 55 millimeters uh, self-propelled guns, which is, you know, the top of the range um, counter-battery radar system that's used by the Royal Artillery, I would have been amazed. But we're doing just that. So we are now providing frontline equipment, and it's in the front line, uh, so that um, uh, the Ukrainians have been able to start hitting back. Because don't don't make the mistake of thinking that because there have been uh, marginal gains in the Donbass, that this means Mr. Putin's winning. Um, you know, the point here, Sarah, that everybody needs to grasp, it's something which we discussed, by the way, just last week. Um, I'm a fellow of something called the Centre for Brexit Policy, and we issued the first grand strategy report uh, that's yet been published, take, take account of Putin's war. And in it, we pointed out uh, very strongly that uh, what's happening here is, is really that it's, uh, Putin is having a clarifying effect in two ways. Uh, one is very unfortunate, which is that he's ruined the reputation of Russia uh, because he cannot win this war. But on the other hand, um, he can't afford to lose it personally, and that puts us into a danger zone. And that makes the fact that the EU has basically fallen apart, rather like an overripe lemon. You know, it's got a sort of green outer skin, which reveals a rather rotten red pit inside, to put it bluntly. Um, this has all been exposed by the war. And, and going back to my first point, Mr. Putin has now, by these stupid actions, succeeded in helping the West to reunite, to bring back the, the stray sheep like Mr. Macron and, to a certain extent, Mr. Schultz, to bring them back into the fold. I would suspect that they would they would view it differently and, and would say that, you know, obviously you're going to have disparate views with, within different nations, that Germany maybe has moved further than, than ever before uh, it, since the Second World War in, in making a stand against a, a threatening neighbour or an invading neighbour. But I just wanted to ask you a little bit about what you think sanctions do at this point, Professor, because there's a lot of talk about cap on on energy coming in, there's sanctions on gold, etc. Will, yeah. will, any, will any of that have much effect? And is there a real danger of Putin retaliating by just cutting off oil and gas? Well, all of those things are, uh, are true, implied in your question. The sanctions that have been imposed have been... Uh, extremely wide, and they will become wider. And they are certainly successful because the Russian economy, remember, before this war began, it was only the size of the Italian, no, actually, it's smaller, the Spanish economy. Um, and it has been cratered. Uh, the sorts of sanctions that we're imposing now, that is the free world, by the way. It's not just us. Yes, Britain is in the lead. I mean, there's no question about that. You know, we, we are 
um, uh, although we're not used to it, we have this sort of declinist way of thinking about ourselves, as though we're somehow some, some poor country that's going down the pan. Simply not true. Uh, you know, since February, we have been leading the free world on supporting uh, the Ukrainians. And without our weapons, the Ukrainians would have lost in the first week. We need to remember that. But the sanctions that we are now imposing, um, it's not just the ones you've mentioned. It's also things like microchips. There are some credible reports that one of the reasons that uh, Russian armed forces are running out of, uh, of weapons is that they're running out of microchips. It's rather like the reason that you have to wait so long to buy a new car at the moment, because the microchip manufacturers um, you know, aren't able to keep up with demand after the pandemic. And so the Russians apparently have been taking microchips out of uh, things like you know, domestic machines, like washing machines and dish dyers, which you can repurpose and you put them into various sorts of military equipment. But that's a sign uh, on the physical side of something which we're seeing this week on the human side, because Mr. Putin has lost now, killed in action. I think it's more, 10 certainly, possibly 11 generals and almost 50 colonels. Who, and why were they killed? They were killed because they were killed in the front line uh, trying to get disheartened Russian troops to actually fight. And so he really is scraping the barrel. He's just brought back a man who weighs 25 stone, I think, called Mr. Peskov, who was a general from the days of the Afghan war, to put him in charge. And he has sacked General Devonikov, who's usually known cheerfully by his uh, nickname, the Butcher of Aleppo. Um, because he's doing actually what Hitler did at the end of Hitler's life and war. He's trying to micromanage a war which he thinks that his generals are not fighting well enough. So he's bringing in these, these sort of retired retreads who are hardly likely to be able to improve the performance of the Russian armed forces. Professor, it's good to speak to you and thank you. Professor Gwythian Prince.